So, Greg, thank you so much for agreeing to do this conversation interview. And I am delighted to talk to you about um, Neoplatonic theurgy and this idea of having um, bringing appearances of the gods to mortals. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background, your books and your interest in the subject. Sure. Um, I'm, I'll have to decide where to where to really focus it or start. Is because you're interested in dreams and and theurgy, and I think that I it would be fair to say that probably the most powerful awakening experiences in my life, in terms of spirituality, came through dreams, and um, these are dreams that were so powerful for me that they seemed more real than my waking life. Um, and so I was struck at a very young age, I'd say early 20s, that there's a reality that we don't normally see or live in. And it was revealed to me in my dream experiences. So that got me on, on the path of searching for some sort of spiritual, you know, discipline that could get me closer to that world. And I practiced yoga for many years. Um, and then after I practiced yoga for many years, I began to feel as if <clears throat> that approach was um, a little bit too much of a um, escapist uh, kind of path, trying to get out of the world. Uh, the world is a place I don't wanna be. My body's a place I don't wanna inhabit. And I began to be suspicious that that kind of discipline was really not, um, not complete enough. And I wanted a more uh, complete sort of path. And about the time that I began to uh, realize that, I discovered um, the Neoplatonists and Iamblichus in particular. And if you know something about Iamblichus and some of your uh, viewers might know something about him, he, re he represents a, a form of Neoplatonism or Platonism. It, it should be said that none of these Neoplatonists call themselves Neoplatonists. That's a, a modern term that we put on them. But they did have a distinct kind of spiritual emphasis of interpreting Plato's dialogues. And Iamblichus in particular was known for embracing uh, the material world and the body. So about the time that I began to think that it was okay to embrace my body and the material world, I discovered Iamblichus, who laid out um, a whole kind of metaphysics that said yes to the material world and to our bodies. So that's a little bit of my background. And, um, but I probably said too much, but I just wanted to say something to give you a sense of where I came from. One of the things that I found especially fascinating in your book, Hellenic Tantra, is this idea of the symbol of the mirror. And it reflects uh, an idea in ancient Anatolia of mirrors being magical tools. And, you know, some of the earliest mirrors ever made were made in ancient Anatolia. Mm. And it struck me when Iamblichus looks at the mirror as having this double function of reflecting the real world and providing a portal through which you can see into something else. And one of the other magical symbols in Anatolia that's often represented and often has seems to have a lot to do with uh, female magic is the spindle and the thread. So this idea of Tantra, this idea of the divine being a thread that is woven together to make the material world, I find very sort of natural and intuitively makes sense to me. And the more I read about Iamblichus, the more I think uh, he has this fantastic vision of the cosmos of divinity, and of divinity being the material from which everything is made. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd love to get a little bit more background on his view of oracles and healing um, miracles that come through dreaming, because he talks a little bit about the temples of Asclepius and how 
um, the magic or the healing practices that were occurring there came from dreams delivered by the god, so direct revelations from Asclepius, but also a blend of physical um, medical arts being practiced alongside sacred visions. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just take a piece of what you talked about there and, and I'll focus on what is it that we encounter when we encounter a, div uh, a divine dream or a dream given by the God. Um, Iamblichus did say that there's two different types of imagination, two different types of dreams. Some come from the gods and some just come from our you know, day-to-day -day imagination. But even those dreams that seem to come or that those images that seem to come, visions that seem to come from the gods and we see some kind of god or goddess, um, there's a blend. And this is what later Platonists like Proclus say as well. There's a kind of a blending of the power of the vision that comes from the god and the way that it's portrayed to us in our imagination. And the way that it's portrayed to us in our imagination comes from our own imaginative background, whether it's our family or our culture or our personal life, so that we provide a kind of body for the power to appear to us. And that's why I think that people who have near-death experiences, for example, um, they come from a Christian culture, many of them, and they'll say, oh, I saw Jesus, or... or if, if it's a Jew, he might say, she might say, well, I saw a council of rabbis sitting there. So what we'll see depends largely on our cultural background, but the power that's conveyed in what we see comes from that other world, comes from the divine world, which Iamblichus refers to as the gods. And it's so uh, it's yeah. true, what we're seeing is true, but it's not literally true in that sense. Do you yeah. think that this may have been something that was informed by Iamblichus's position in Syria, where he has access and knowledge of those gods and the gods of Egypt and his uh, training it, through Plato? Well, you know, it, it's a little bit mysterious as to how Egyptian Iamblichus is and how Syrian he is. There's no question that he's a Syrian that he is Syrian. His name, Iamblichus, is from a Syrian background. His, his, um, his ancestors were, were uh, Syrian priests. Um, so he was Syrian. Um, there's evidence though, and, and from himself in particular, that he was in Egypt as well. And he's familiar with the Egyptian practices and Egyptian, we call it Egyptian magic or Egyptian religion. Um, and in fact, his, um, best known book for us is a, a response to a bunch of questions that were asked of him by Porphyry called, and his response is now called On the Mysteries. And essentially he, he responds as if he were an Egyptian priest responding, uh, answering all the questions that Porphyry asked him. I'm going a little bit on a tangent here, but Porphyry was challenging the ritual and visionary sort of practices of the Amblichus as a Platonist. And suggesting, well, that's not really Platonism. You're kind of going off on a tangent here. You're becoming what we would call today superstitious. And Iamblichus said, no, in fact, what we're doing is a fulfillment of these Platonic metaphysical principles. So there's a lot of Platonism and Pythagoreanism blended with his uh, Egyptian references in On the Mysteries. So and also he says that the Assyrians uh, understood this, what he would call ancient tradition, old religion. Um, it comes from the gods directly and is not made up by human beings. So Iamblichus saw himself as a kind of a conduit um, or a custodian of sacred tradition that was preserved by the Syrians and particularly by those Syrians in um, Apamea who were receiving transmissions that were later written down as the Chaldean oracles. And Iamblichus was uh, rep reported to be a master of those oracles and wrote um, commentaries on them. So he's, he's immersed in Egyptian lore and Chaldean lore and Syrian lore, a 
the piece so of platonic it's, it's the Pythagorean human as well. Organism, you know, according to his view, is the human organism acting as a lens and a vessel for this divine uh, essence. Yes, that's a nice way to put it. Um, we are, as human, we're embodiments of a, a divine mind, essentially, for Iamblichus. And that the role of the world soul and the role of our individual souls is to mediate the divine mind into this world. So each human being is a potential manifestation of the divine mind or the demiurge, as the Platonists would call it. Um, but the problem is that most people don't realize that. This is the whole point of Platonism was to wake up to our connection with the divine mind. This is the, the focus of Platonism and the Amplicus himself is fulfilling the Platonic tradition by first developing your mind and going through certain purification sort of exercises, letting go of, of uh, habits of emotion and thinking that keep us confused and then becoming open. I think that you were getting at this or becoming a receptacle to the divine to come down and work through us. Well, that was a, an interesting other thing that really struck me. Um, I can't remember which character said this now. It was something that on first reading sounded a little bit um, uh, egotistical. It was something about um, someone, I can't remember what, who it was now. It was about one of the philosophers saying that he shouldn't go to the gods, the gods should come to him. Right. Uh -huh. I know that story. It's a famous okay. story about Plotinus. Okay. So I really love yeah. that because to me, when later on it talks about the work of the theogist being to align to the divine principle rather than the work of the sorcerer, which calls the divine into them. And yeah. that's a, a more kind of uh, individualistic, human orientated idea that we are taking divine power rather right. than. I'm going to align myself. And to me, that's the essence of ancient Greek ritual in terms of um, becoming one with gods or goddesses is that you're aligning to the divine essence of that divinity. And that's how they come upon you. So at first reading, what seems slightly egotistical actually seems kind of humble in a way that the deities should deign to come to you rather than the other way around. Well, you know, that that particular passage, um, it's for the gods to come to me, not for me to go to the gods, which is attributed to uh, Plotinus by Porphyry. Um, it, it can be interpreted in different ways. I choose not to interpret it as an egocentric um, statement by Plotinus. Plotinus was a profound mystic, and he had a different, um, you could say, uh, the Buddhist term for it is upaya. He had a different spiritual discipline for becoming united with the divine, uh, different from uh, Iamblichus. Um, he did not embrace rituals, uh, Plotinus, and he felt that we needed simply to go within and recover this divine soul that, that never really descends from the divine mind, but it's within us. And Iamblichus did not agree with that approach. So when Porphyry says that um, Plotinus refused to go to the it's a, it's a lunar goddess uh, ritual. Uh, it's for them to come to me, not for me to go to them. You could interpret it that as um, I'm too elevated to worship this lunar deity, and that sounds egocentric. Or you could say he's uh, humble enough to realize that he can't manipulate how the gods are contacted but he has to let them contact him. Mm. So I, I think Plotinus was subtle enough not to have an egocentric view about it, but it's been interpreted in different ways. Mm. And, he, and the fact of the matter is that he did not encourage ritual uh, practice. And he also suggested that the, the soul never completely descends into this world Whereas Iamblichus said, yeah, the soul really does completely descend into the body 
and really undergoes a kind of um, alienation from its divine self. And because of that alienation, we need help and we need to do rituals and we need the presence of these divine beings in the world to help us remember who we really are. This is a little like drinking the waters of Lethe upon being born and forgetting your divine origin, because one of the things that I'm really interested about with regards to divine dreaming in ancient Greek ritual is the waters of Minimosini and the relationship between Minimosini and divine remembrance. And it's interesting also to me that she's the mother of the muses because that makes her the source of all inspiration in the world and divine inspiration is is the possession that um, Iamblichus recognizes as being the presence of the divine within mortals. Would that be? Yes. Uh, now, you're right that the waters of Lethe is, is what Plato uses to describe uh, the kind of the forgetfulness that human souls experience when we come into this world so that we don't remember our divine origins and we wander around thinking we're just mortals and just bodies. Now, the, the waters of memory, I'm not so familiar with that. Tell me more about that. And, and is that from Plato or it's a different tradition? I'm just not uh, up to speed on that one. Well, it's mentioned on the Orphic Gold Tablets Okay. Mm -hmm. It was um, part of the Oracle of Trophonius at Livadia, where mm -hmm. people seeking the Oracle would drink first from the waters of Lethe to forget everything that happened so far, which I think is quite interesting as well, because these oracles seem to have been um, uh, consulted when people were in very difficult situations because they were kind of known as the cave of nightmares. So they must have been quite frightening, but people still went to them to find out something. So anyway, mm -hmm. first of all, you drink from the waters of Lethe and there are these two rivers. And then you are lowered by your feet into a hole where there are serpents. And it seems like there's a kind of crack in the rock, maybe some water, because people mention water. It's, it's mentioned in Pafsanius. And um, then when you're pulled out, or before you go into the Oracle, I should say, you drink the waters of Minimosini to remember everything you're about to encounter. And then when you're pulled out, you're sat on the chair of Minimosini to um, to uh, say what you've experienced to the Oracle attendants. And then the Oracle attendants construct an Oracle out of that. And um, so for me, I, I mean, it's also mentioned in some places that Minimosini was involved in the ritual activity at the Asclepia so that she would be invoked so that um, sleepers or those people taking part in the sacred sleep would remember their dreams. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, like especially looking at the Orphic hymn to Minimosini, it seems like that role of remembering is a form of inspiration in itself, like the inspired remembrance of your divine origins. And that occurring in a dream gives you this kind of ec ecstasy that enables you to remember who and where you are within a dream and therefore have a more um, deep experience of any encounter that you would have with Asclepius when he performs his healing miracles on you in the dream, perhaps. One of the things that I've thought with regards to divine dreams from ancient texts and inscriptions is that when it describes encounters with gods and goddesses, there's often also this description of like ecstasy and bliss, the heart overflowing as if it were a beer pot. And that ecstasy and bliss is the same thing that I think happens when you have a lucid dream and you suddenly wake up within the dream. And um, I've often kind of equated it with, uh, you know, if you have a crush on someone, you love them. There's a lot of energy towards seeing this person in your dream. And when you see them, you get very excited and that excitement wakes you up within the dream. So I've always thought that people that adored particular gods and goddesses in ancient times, when they saw them in a dream, they would become excited and that would wake them up to the fact that they were dreaming because they were having, you know, witnessing their heart's desire in front of them in a dream. So that their, um, their attention would be aroused within the dream. Yeah, exactly. That, that they were witnessing the deity. Yeah, it's like a trigger. Uh, yeah, sure. Interesting. Um, my guess is that um, 
your interest in dreams and dreaming is based on some powerful dreams that you've had yourself. Is that right? I've always been really into lucid dreaming and uh, especially interested in the ecstatic elements of it. And that was another mm -hmm. question I wanted to ask you, actually, when, when in in when the ancient Greeks talk of ecstasy, are they referring to out of body experiences? Because it sounds like it's out of body, it's outside of the self. So is that ecstasy? OK, that's an interesting question. Um, the answer is yes and no. It depends what we mean by body. But um, uh, it's what's interesting is that for Plotinus, who we were talking about before, uh, he really never talks about ecstasy. And it's, and it's not that important for him because we don't need to go outside ourselves because it's within. And so he emphasizes that. But for Iamblichus, ecstasy is absolutely necessary for an encounter with the gods because we, we start our, our journey or our spiritual discipline in the state of being identified with our localized self, our body, our ego, and so on. And in order to um, be released from that kind of habit, we need to step out of it. We need to go outside of it. And ecstasy, literally, ecstasis means to go outside our uh, habitual orientation. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily leave the body, but you leave the mindset that you've been identified with. So that in fact, you, you might still be, people looking at you might still see you in your body, but there might be a different presence now inhabiting your body. And Iamblichus did talk about being possessed by the gods. And for a Western rational person who goes to graduate school and studies the history of religions and the methodology of studying religions, it's basically an intellectual enterprise. And when we read about um, somebody like Iamblichus talking about people, people becoming possessed by the gods, and he talks about degrees of possession, this much, that much, and which god or goddess possesses the person you can tell by the way they behave. Most of us um, academics are completely clueless about what he's really talking about because it, it sounds like he's talking, it, it, we don't experience that. Whereas if we were living in Haiti or in um, a culture where people were possessed on a regular basis, like we lived in Indonesia or, or Bali, we would see people being possessed regularly and we would know what deity it was that was possessing the person. That's the kind of world that Iamblichus lived in. But go ahead, you have something on your mind. What well, I was it? just going to say, because I've been very interested in Mesopotamian divination as well. I interviewed Irving Finkel about uh, dream oracles, and I'm interested in the kind of classification of different divining arts in Mesopotamia. So there was the possessed diviner, the diviner that was possessed. And so I think yeah. that considering where Iamblichus was, he would definitely have encountered the possession divination. Oh, for sure. Part. Yeah, um, he describes it in detail. Yeah, so yeah. so that would that would have informed his worldview, and it does seem that he's kind of created this perfect blend of like rational reasoning and the embodied divinatory arts of the area that he was in at the time. Right. In fact, this was really difficult for scholars and classical scholars in particular when they first encountered Iamblichus, who represented uh, the culmination of the Platonic tradition in the fourth century. And they said, well, how could he possibly represent uh, Platonism and rationality when he's talking about people being possessed by spirits and gods? I mean, that's, and, and the people who initially wrote about Iamblichus among our scholars were people like E.R. Dodds, a great classical scholar who was also very familiar with spiritualist circles that were around in Europe at the time. And he, he thought it was a bunch of um, bullshit, basically, that, that spirits were not possessing these mediums, that it was a, a, a delusion and superstition. And so when he read about this in Iamblichus, he thought, well, it's the same thing. It's superstitious and delusion. Um, 
And I think that Dodds, the funny thing about Dodds, I don't know if you know much about him, he could never quite forget these mediumistic uh, experiences that he witnessed. And he was interested in par the paranormal until the end of his life. Uh, he was even the president of the uh, Society for Psychical Research uh, in, the, in the 60s. So, but back to the Amplicus and being possessed, um, there are people even today that experience this sort of thing. And I helped to organize a conference at Harvard just recently called uh, Platonism as a Living Tradition. And among the people we invited was a man that I know who happens to be a Santeria priest and shaman. And in his religion, they have the practice of people being possessed by the Orishas, which are these um, angelic gods and spirits that come in and possess people. And he described to us in detail how that happens. And he, the way he described it was just the same way that Iamblichus described it. You can see how far the possession goes, how deep it is, how complete it is, or whether it's authentic or not, or whether the person is faking the possession for some sort of egocentric reasons. He made all the distinctions that Iamblichus made, um, and he's witnessed it, and he's their, their, um, their priest. And one of the people in our, our meeting asked him if he had been possessed, and he answered rather humbly, yes, I have. So there, there are people who understand this kind of material from inside out. Mm -hmm. And most of us, including me, being um, a scholar and, and, and a rational kind of approach, we are very sympathetic to it or, or we imagine it as, as real. But there's a difference between imagining it as real and being sympathetic to it and actually undergoing these possessions oneself, which is what um, his name was Jose Redondo, a fantastically um, a skilled uh, scholar in Platonism as well, but also Santeria priest. So people were possessed by the deities. And in order to be possessed, you had to undergo ecstasy. You had to step outside of your habitual kind of mindset in order to re become a receptacle for the divine. How is it that you step out of your habitual mindset? You perform a ritual. You chant the names of the gods or the goddesses. You listen to certain drum beats, uh, rhythms, and music to shift you out of your habitual state of mind and make you more receptive to something coming in from outside you. That's the, the ecstasy is stepping outside your habitual state of mind and making you a receptacle to the divine that comes in. So that's, I mean, it's a very, very elaborate process, but uh, something that they did on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. reading about it reminded me of um, the czar rituals in Egypt and Africa of possession and the induced kind of states of trance and ecstasy that these groups get into and the kind of demon or the spirit that comes in is is said to either wear the body of the possessed person like clothing or riding. Yes, it. exactly. Riding, riding the possessed person or entering. Um, there's a story in um, Eunapius's Lives of Philosophers, in which he talks about, he writes about Iamblichus and some of the others. And he said that on one occasion, um, a, a medium from Egypt was um, being entertained by a bunch of people and he said that he would become the um he would transmit the, the god apollo for them by going into a trance and letting apollo speak so he began to speak to them as the god apollo and they were all transfixed in, in a state of awe and Iamblichus came in the room and said don't be fooled that's not the god apollo that's the spirit of a dead gladiator who just wants to get your attention I love so <laughs> Well, it's a great story because it's not just this simple, oh, do it, let a spirit come in, it's all going to be real. Yeah. There was a lot of discrimination that was involved in what kind of spirit is coming in. Mm. And a lot of it depends on who's the receptacle, how pure is the person that's receiving this, this uh, entity. And um, there are people even today that, that are channelers. And really the question is... Um, how how pure are they, you know, and I don't mean pure in some sort of moralistic way, 
but I mean, how clean is their receptacle to receive what's coming through? And this, they're not all the same. No, not it's all interesting equally. that he doesn't just um, say that that is an Apollo. He identifies that it's actually this other entity. That's amazing because very often, obviously, channelers are rubbished and disparaged. But to say that they he could recognize who this person was channeling and that was an Apollo. And I wonder whether he thought that the channeler was being um, duped by this uh, gladiator. Is that well? That's the good. That's a good question. I think there's two different ways we can look at. At, at people who do channeling, there's the rationalistic disparagement of them and say, well, this is all rubbish. Anything along these lines is just somebody who's trying to trick you and take your money. And therefore the whole bunch of it is, is hokum. That's not a very deep critique. And I think what Iamblichus represents is somebody who's on the inside of that world, who knows that there are spirits, who knows that they can be channeled, but he knew enough about it so that he could see what it was that was coming through. And so he doesn't dismiss it from the point of view that a lot of us today would dismiss it and say, oh, not, nothing like that can happen. Uh, but he knew it could happen. He just thought it was a, a dead gladiator. And so. he experiences it personally himself because he talks about Hermes being his patron god. So is yes, that, he does. Is that um, a god that he felt connected to? For sure. Hermes is the god of writing and the god of thinking and, and words. And I think that any of us who are immersed in, in writing as a discipline, to the degree that sometimes what we write is deeper than what we thought we knew, something's happening. And I, I don't think it's really wrong for somebody to feel as if the spirit of Hermes uh, was being received and how much, I mean, people can take that the wrong way and say, I'm a channel for Hermes, listen to me. But, but I understand that, that some of us who write, um, and I know myself that I, after I've written some things, I think, oh my God, whoa, that, that was pretty good. You know, and, and you don't know what you know until you've, you've written it or in the process of writing it, then you see something knows that you didn't know you knew. And, and there's a kind of a channeling that goes in to the, the process of deep writing, I think. A divine inspiration that comes through sometimes that you recognize as being uh, the kind of um, perfect feeling eloquence somehow. Yeah, right, right. And, and for each of us, it's going to be a little bit different. But I even think novelists who write in, in a very creative way and their characters really seem alive, they feel as if these characters are alive and they, they enter into their voice. And if they didn't, they couldn't write with, with the kind of tangible feeling that you get from a good novel. Well, there is that research, isn't there? Um, I read a while ago, I can't remember where it's from, but just explaining that when you read a novel, because I've always been really into reading novels, I think something different happens when you read uh, a novel as opposed to when you read nonfiction. Um, mm -hmm. And it was saying that when you read a novel, you create new neural pathways that are associated with, to some in some dimension, kind of living out the experiences of the characters in the novel which mm -hmm. is very interesting and brings me on to this different um, different understanding of imagination, this understanding okay. of imagination as being the, the manifestation of images, the appearance of images, which is a different... We, we tend to think of imagination in a different way now. Oh, well, yeah, we do. And when we say imagination, we sometimes say, oh, it's just your imagination as if it's nothing but imagination. But that's all we have is imagination. Everything is imagination. Everything is imagined. Um, and Iamblichus does distinguish between what he calls imagination that's divine, comes from the gods, and imagination, which is just an ordinary imagination. Um, and when the imagination is awakened um, or, or possessed or 
receives this kind of divine influence, um, it's more than just your imagination. And, and it flows through and you can, um, it becomes the vehicle by which you enter into communion with the gods. In fact, it all happens in the imagination for Amplicus. Um, the, the whole process goes through imagination. And it's not the ordinary imagination. It's something like what Henry Corbin called the imaginal. Um, it's an in-between world where the divine appears to us in the form of images because there's no other way for it to appear to us. That's how we engage it, is through images. Um, and it's not just I'm cooking it up. I think that um, the romantic uh, poet uh, Coleridge um, talks about imagination and he says there's two kinds. There's just fancy, which is, you know, we make things up. And then there's this kind of deeply creative imagination where we participate in the imagination of reality, that reality is constantly being imagined by, by the divine. Well, that and makes me think a lot that. of um, sort of ancient Australian beliefs, this idea of a continuum of consciousness, of story making with every thought and idea and every atom of the world is this tapestry of imagination in some, could be seen in some respects, the dreaming. The dream time is now, mm. if, we, if we can enter into it which is what they would do. That's why they would do their rituals and dance around and, and enter into what I would call a theurgic state of ecstasy or ecstasy so that the dream time could start, they could be participants in the dream time and dream the world into existence. Yeah. Because that's what the gods do is they create, they're constantly creating the world. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about Iamblichus associating with Hermes is also the relationship. Hermes is obviously the Greek version of Thoth and Thoth creates the hieroglyphs or gives hieroglyphs to mankind. And one of the things, because I started teaching myself hieroglyphs during lockdown and there was something very interesting that happened to my dreams when I started learning hieroglyphs because although they represent phonetic values and then you obviously have the um, the determinatives and the phonetic complements and the different kind of categories of hieroglyphs that just represent real things, um, there's something very different about the way pic uh, pictographic scripts like that, hieroglyphic scripts like that, make you think about the world. And one of the things that occurred to me when I was learning it was that um, scribes who were using hieroglyphs to write would every now and again encounter configurations of real world things in the world and read something and it could be a mess and it could be seen as the kind of language of the divine so hieroglyphs are a reflection of the fact that the things of the world are divine that the material world is divine because the hieroglyphs are the medunedja the divine words the words of god so everything, you know, the, it kind of perfectly expresses the Egyptian worldview, Iamblichus's idea of the divine being in matter all the time. It's interesting you put it that way. The netters, this divine presences in the world are revealed in animals and in insects and everything else. And that the hieroglyphs represent the life of those things in those pictures the hieroglyphic pictures. And it's different from an alphabet. Mm. It's, um, um, and I think even Plotinus talks about how the Egyptians uh, preserved this sort of divine sort of connection with, with uh, the gods with their um, ideograms, with their hieroglyphs. And um, which means, you know, literally sacred um, writing. Sacred carvings, yeah. Yeah, the, sacred carving, yeah. But, but as a, in Egyptian, they are divine words. And to me, that's like saying that everything in the world has this kind of divine breath in it, this divine essence within it. Um, and, it, you know, looking, because I've spoken to a lot of Egyptologists and interviewed a lot of Egyptologists, and you recognise in... Uh, even things like Egyptian furniture or Egyptian large items that are designed to represent the 
the glyphs. So like a libation bowl is the sun glyph or, you know, a, a person's tomb furniture could be laid out to spell a word. Like there's just writing and everything. It is the the kind of um, web of life. It connects everything together. So I've always thought that it's fascinating how Thoth is, it makes sense that Thoth is the god of writing and of magic because writing is magic. Writing is mm, mm, is mm. is writing reality in in that sense. No, I like the way you're putting that. Um, there is uh, an uninterrupted continuity yeah. from the divine into this world. It's reflected in nature. It's uh, reflected in the in the hieroglyphs. It's reflected in well, how the Egyptians lived their lives and how they built their temples and how they lived everything. It, it yeah. was, they were trying to manifest the divine in their life. Yeah, I think it was a very practical infusion of divine symbols into every strata of life so that it was inescapable. Even as an illiterate peasant, you could read that in the symbols. You could understand that from the things of the world. Because this idea that, you know, the vast population of ancient Egypt were illiterate is interesting to me because you think they have these monuments everywhere and so many things covered covered in writing and symbols. There must have been some cognition of them to some extent, you know, there must have been some understanding. If they could oh, for sure all text, they would have been able to get the gist of some things, I imagine. I think <laughs> how would I put this? It's usually the people who are the most educated who I find are the most dense when it comes to um, picking up on these traditions mm. and, and the kind of spirituality of, of um, whether it's the Egyptians or the Neoplatonists. Um, the other thing that you were mentioning is that this world is seen as a manifestation of the divine. Mm. There's nothing wrong about the material world. The material world is the way that the spiritual world reveals itself. And that's um, that's a, a kind of a, a way of, of experiencing ourselves that we lost. And I think to some degree, the apocalyptic kind of traditions of early Christianity where Satan has taken over this world and we need to get away from this world and get away from the body and that we need to build a kind of an institution that will be fighting against the evil presences of the demons in the world, that did a number on us. And, and it cut us out of this, this flow that you were describing about the way the Egyptians live with hieroglyphs and nature and everything else. That, um, and I think that we're, we haven't yet really recovered our continuity with, yeah, with that. Yeah, I agree. I, th I blame the Bronze Age collapse. Oh, okay. Well, one of the things I've thought about hieroglyphs as well is that they sort of represent a kind of holographic way of looking at any single element of the world. And I think that this is something that's reflected in Iamblichus's view as well, this idea that everything is within everything and that this okay, that's what you mean, yeah. is performed. So um, it reminded me of uh, King Shulgi, um, he was like a very, very proud of his ability in divination and reading the omens in sheep's livers. And he has this quote that something like, I, the king, can see within the, the liver of a single lamb or a single sheep, everything and anything, everything and everywhere in the world, which I think is very interesting because it represents that same idea of the fact that um, the the material objects of divination, the sacrificed animal, the lots, the knuckle bones, they aren't the divining feature. They are just expressions through which you can see the divine moving. And if you understand the way the things of the world and the way nature moves, then you can always read oracles in it. Yeah, that's a nice point. In fact, in, in there's a, a passage or a chapter in here on divination, in, according to Iamblichus, and the word for that is mantike, which is, we, we get our word mantis, which is the diviner. Uh, he says there's two kinds. There's the artificial, where we use knuckle bones or astrology, or we use tarot cards or, you know, um, look at birds or whatever. And then there is the natural, where the God just comes in. 
and takes possession of you. It might be in, in a possession or it might be in a dream. And Yamlika says that this, this divine presence permeates the whole world and it's in us too, but it's just a question of tapping into it. And, and that's for him what, what the mantis does. And so in effect, every theurgist has to become a mantis, has to become a diviner, has to be able to awaken this presence of the divine that's revealing itself in all of these different things, whether it's tarot or uh, knuckleballs or whatever it is you use. And it also reveals itself in divine dreams and in a direct way like that. Yeah, well, that's it's, it's everywhere. That's interesting because um, the people that worked in the temples of Asclepius were Yatromantis. They were physician seers. They had that ability to divine um, oracles from people's dreams. And one of the things that really struck me reading your book was um, when you described those degrees of possession, because that mm. to me seems to be almost uh, ritualized in the Asclepia. So you have the uh, the participation, the communion, and the merging. And that almost seems to be recognized in the processes of the Asclepia where you have the divine theater, the mm -hmm. uh, catharsis, then you have the communion, the theogenia, the feast with the God sharing the meal. And then you have the merging with the God in the Enchimeterion when you have the divine dream and Asclepius actually comes to you. That's a, that's really a perfect sort of mirror of what Iamblichus describes in terms of being possessed by the God. Um, those three different levels. You should probably write an article about that. I mean, that's that's a. <laughs> well, a it, it's literally. I just read that bit now and was like, that's exactly like how the Asclepia function. That must have been um, like a recognized, like an already established um, understanding of the processes of. Well, because you have um, Telesphorus as well as Asclepius is son or companion and he represents the fulfillment the completion and this merging with the god is the cure is the completion the fulfillment of the cure so that to me just makes perfect sense like it's so it's very clear that there was this idea of stages of um possession or uh curing and that the idea of being cured is this idea of alignment with your divinely intended self as well. Tell mm -hmm. us what it represents this divine blueprint of the perfected version of yourself. That's, that's, I didn't know that. That's nice. That's an interesting Asclepian sort of um, insight. And what I think is interesting is that you could see the stages of what Iamblichus talks about in possession and theurgically reflected in this Asclepian rite. And that doesn't surprise me in a way because um, what I think that, you know, when people read Iamblichus's um, On the Mysteries and they see what he says about you know, how these rituals are contacting the gods, and they say, well, how come he doesn't provide a specific recipe to do this? How come he doesn't make, you know, a very explicit? Uh, and he doesn't. But, but the framework that he provides can be applied to lots of different religious groups. The traditions of Asclepius, for example, and, and dream divination and the curing that way. But it also could be applied to, um, I've seen Christians apply it to the Eucharist and how they understand the sacraments. And um, I've, I've encountered people who do uh, practice with, um, magical traditions uh and they apply iamblichus theurgy precisely to what they're doing so what's interesting i think and i think what's valuable about theurgy as an idea is that it's a kind of algebra or algebraic sort of structure that can be applied to all kinds of different um traditions in different groups but certainly what your application to the asclepian one is it's really remarkable what you just said. It's a perfect sort of mirror, I think, of what the um, applicants talks about. It's given me like a, it's really inspired me actually, because another aspect of this is this idea of holism, of a holistic way of treating an individual and that prophecy 
can be healing because prophecy is truth revealing prophet and truth revealing in and of itself is healing and Igia, Asclepius's wife or, or daughter usually is more than health she is a holistic harmonizing holism completion she represents that idea of um completely recalibrating and rebalancing to the a holistic whole so and also Igea was a, a a greeting of the Pythagoreans so that does connect quite nicely with why this would be something that was already established and something mm. Iamblichus would be aware of this idea of um the kind of curative properties of prophecy yeah um he <laughs> Well, prophecy was, it wasn't like telling the future. Yeah. It was a way of bringing yourself into orientation with what's divine in you. Um, and what's interesting is that Porphyry asked him, well, what about this oracle here? What about that oracle there? And, and um, you know, at Delphi, does a priest, you know, is he suffused in these fumes? Is that what's going to bring about this? And the Amplicus at one point says, did you forget about all these, uh, it's like, um, going on a tour of, of um, Disneyland of oracles. This stuff happens to us every day, just in the way that we live, if you're open to it. And I thought that was a pretty interesting and powerful comment that he made. Yes, the oracles exist and they manifest these principles that we actually inhabit and live every single day. So but we're sort of dramatic. Yeah, we're all oracular if we were able to engage it. Yeah, that's right. very much how I feel about um, dreaming as well, that it is always revealing the future to us. And in fact, the whole of life reveals the future to us all the time. And one of the interesting things I read in your book is this idea that the gods stop us from seeing the future all the time. As a, that's right. Because why would we? We don't necessarily always want to see it because it would be distracting and disorientating. So it should be held from us and only if we put concerted effort into it, can it be revealed to us? And also sometimes uh, he says that um, if it's better for their soul not to know something, then it won't be revealed. So, so that um, the purpose of, of going into an oracular state is not to get insight into some sort of event that's gonna happen in the future, but it's to bring you closer to the divine. That's the purpose of uh, prophecy is bring you closer to the divine, make you um, a friend of the gods, you could say, rather than um, trying to find out what's going to happen next week. Well, that's interesting in terms of the kind of Mesopotamian view of oracles that um, you petitioned your personal gods um, and you won that favor. And in that way, they could change your fate. And that so an oracle isn't necessarily a a direct reading of events that are definitely going to unfold that kind of hints or possibilities that you could change if you win back the favor of your personal gods. Mm, that's interesting. So, um, so you've studied the Mesopotamian traditions and, and there's understanding of oracles and um, you spent time in Greece and you've gone to places like Delphi, I imagine, and other sacred sites. Um, what's sort of holding your, your practice together? I mean, what, what do you see as driving you in, in this? Um... Uh, well, I've had dreams where I've been visited by gods. And so, so much of this, like I love, I've listened to a lot of your other interviews and I love how you talk about um, what really turns you on to Iamblichus is the fact that he described things that you've experienced. And I have that experience too. Mm -hmm. When I read yeah. about these divine dreams that people have had, I've had those experiences. I had a dream that Hura Mazda came to me and um, he infused me with divine light and I could see close up and far away at the same time, inside and outside. So I could see him coming down from heaven and I could see uh, my DNA spirals unspiraling to become ladders that he could then walk down as kind of ladders of light. And it was this amazing, like irradiated, ecstatic, blissful healing dream. And I woke up feeling great. And I've had numerous dreams where I, because I'm so into and interested in gods and symbology. And that's why I think hieroglyphs are amazing for people to study 
symbols and hieroglyphs because these are the things that work their way into our dream. They're a dream language just naturally because they represent real things of the world. So, um, Your Ahara Mazda dream is, is compelling. It's beautiful. And the DNA and, and the walking down like a staircase of your DNA. And I could feel that in that dream, you became, um, how would I put this? Uh, part and parcel of the whole cosmos, that you and the cosmos were sort of united through these images and and you were part of it. Well, I do and have those experiences in dreams. You know, I've, I've never taken um, any psychedelic drugs and it's something that I'm quite interested in, the parallels between psychedelic experiences and uh, dream experiences and psychedelics to me from what I... I can only guess sort of intellectually, although I've had dreams where I've taken psychedelics, I've never taken them in real life, but yeah. um, they seem very much like waking dreams. They seem like dreams that are overlaid. You've got your eyes open. And so they're uh, visual impressions that blend with the visual impressions that are coming from the outside world. So it's this coming together of inner and outer vision that can probably be quite discombobulating. Whereas dreams take place in this, other realm with your eyes closed in the darkness and so they can perhaps have more of a uh especially if they're lucid you can be more conscious of where things are coming from and how the uh action is unfolding but okay lots of it's, it's, that's completely compelling completely real and and authentic and you know it and other people you've met have had similar kinds of experiences maybe not identical but similar enough so that you can kind of feel where they're coming from. But our culture today is not really, um, how would I put this, our religions and, and our ideologies today uh, that, that move the culture don't really seem to have a place for this sort of experience or they don't value it or they don't, they don't this should be the kind of thing <clears throat> that uh, people should be nurtured and helped to, to experience or at least to celebrate. And in our culture, it's not. And it's only fringe people or people aren't just on the outside of, of institutions that seem to have these experiences and value them. And <clears throat> have, you, have you kind of uh, struggled with that um, or wondered why we can't develop a little, a little bit more of a nurturing community to allow for why, these things. The way I think of it, because I've had lucid dreams since I was a kid, it's always been a massive part of my life. The way I see it, and it's one of the things I'm interested in with regards to this different view of imagination in ancient Greece, the phantasmicon, you, uh, the, 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 this idea that you are creating appearances and that the imagination can be real and unreal at the same time. I tend to um, think of it in those terms. I tend to think, you know, when I was a kid, I just thought of the lucid dreams would just blow my mind and make me feel so thankful for the incredible power of the imagination and the ability that I had to explore these like inner, like endless realms. And I think that, I think we we can appreciate this is why dreams is such a great field to be involved in because everyone can recognize that dreams are can be fantastic and healing and magical and they can have real profound effects but at the same time they're kind of safe you know unlike um perhaps psychedelic substances that if someone's fragile or someone has trauma they could provoke psychosis they could um it causes all sorts of problems. And I think it's one of the things that I found quite interesting in psychedelic research is this idea of discernment. Discernment, which Iamblichus talks about as mm -hmm. being really important to distinguish between what is being, what's coming from you as an individual, as an ego, and what may or may not be coming from the divine and showing discernment. And because I've had dreams since I was a kid, I've, I find it relatively easy, I think, anyway, to discern um, 
w where things are coming from in my dreams. And then there are those dreams, like the one I had with the Hura Mazda, that it doesn't matter where it comes from because it was just divine and ecstatic and blissful and made me feel amazing. So who cares if it's really a Hura Mazda or it's because I love reading about gods. It's because I love reading about gods and I've manifested it in the dream. But then that's that's theurgy, right? Manifest mm. is theurgy. You see, now what's interesting is that, um, and I, I've had some dreams, not a Hura Mazda, but I've had dreams that have that kind of, profound power and bliss connected to them and not always bliss sometimes it's there's a terror as well but um but they're powerful and when when people tell you how to make sense of a dream or what did the dream mean what they do is they translate the dream into a kind of conceptual structure of what did the dream mean and you might say oh her mazda means like the god of this and that and you, you, you could create an entire sort of conceptual structure about the dream and even write about it. And it wouldn't touch the power of the dream when you dreamed it. Mm. And I, I've often found that dream interpretation lacks the ability to, to penetrate into the, the images themselves when we experience them in the dream. And um, I struggle to find uh, some Buddy who could do that and I'll just put a plug in here for somebody that that was able to do that um, an individual that that taught um, working with dreams he was influenced by Jung and you're probably familiar with Jung's active imagination the idea of re-entering the dream and then letting the dream dream itself onwards um, the idea is that you can't you can never interpret a dream like that conceptually yeah and have it exhaust its meaning. Yeah. The only way to really get to it is to go back into the dream. But that requires a real discipline of the imagination. And um, I was in a group for years uh, working with a man named Robert Bosnak, who um, works with um, dream images as having a kind of autonomy. Instead of saying, oh, it's you just made that up or it's... But, but rather the images themselves are seen as real and autonomous and you engage them in your imagination and, and not just, oh, it just is my, no, it's real. And you, you re-enter it sort of imaginally. Um, I think that's the only way to really do justice to dreams like that, although nothing could quite do justice to a dream like that you had of a horror monster. Well, they but... also, to me, feel very self-contained. It never occurred to me to try to go back to it because it just felt like um, uh, an event. It felt mm -hmm. like a horror monster infused me with light. That light physically felt like something. It, it, it wasn't something, you know, I mean, I've read about... Um, Greek interpretation and it reflects that idea of iamblichus of like some dreams are divine some dreams are just they come from something divine some dreams need to be interpreted because they might present clues or hints or puzzles and some dreams are just regurgitations of stuff that you've been considering throughout the day there are these classifications and that to me was like an experience dream and right. it didn't need any interpretation because I right. felt it was a power that came to me and um because I've had lots of dreams like that. And when I was looking into the, the fact that there were these, these temples or these dormitories dedicated to having dream encounters like that, right. it just appealed to me immediately, it made sense. Yeah, for sure. There was actually a, a religion that focused on trying to elicit and, and bring about dreams that, like you'd had. I was going to say that, um, I have a recommendation of a book that talks about uh, uses of psychedelics. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of books about psychedelics that are just way out there and so on. But this is written by a man who is um, very unpsychedelic himself. And yet he, he tried to do a good job of it, um, how to change oh, right. your mind. Mm. And he's a, he's a well known writer, he's a good writer. And it's an easy read. And he, um, he basically describes how psychedelics um, have influenced our culture. And he himself had never taken them. Or, but during, in the writing of this book, he does take some 
and reports on what it was like and so on and so forth. And it's um, it's interesting. It's, it doesn't explain everything, but it, it's um, it does talk about some of the, you could say, what are the drawbacks of using psychedelics? What are the you know challenges or or the problems? And and he addresses those in a, in a pretty intelligent way. So it might be something. Like what about um, drug use, narcotics, psychedelics in theurgy, in the practice of theurgy? You know, I've been asked that many times because a lot of people are interested uh, in theurgy, uh, taking um, acid or pot or shrooms, and they think. You know, because theurgy is so inviting for that kind of imagination that they're drawn to it. But there's no concrete evidence that Iamblichus um, encouraged the use of substances. There's a passage um, where Porphyry asks about the use of potions, for example. And so it might have been used, but um, he never says anything explicit about it, which doesn't surprise me. Mm. Well, it, I suppose there wasn't the same sense of uh, discrimination between psychedelic drugs, narcotics, and any kind of herbal medicines in the ancient world. So like, no. they know that opium fumigations and opium mandrake henbane and things like that were used in Near Eastern healing temples and the Asclepia. And they were probably practicing um, using anesthetics in the Asclepia because they were performing proper surgeries and the Yamata describe what sounds like someone waking up from being anesthetized and being sort of discombobulated and confused and not knowing what's going on um, mm -hmm. and being strapped to a table and having their stomachs slit open. So uh, they definitely were using opium as a kind of normal everyday medical uh, drug, but, um, mm. One of the, maybe, I don't know how long we've been doing this for. It's been great. I could talk to you forever. Um, but one of the things I really wanted to ask you about was about Iamblichus as a kind of mystagogue hierophant. And um, a friend of mine, I don't know if you know, uh, Maria Maragou, who's a Greek scholar who wrote a book on the mysteries of Elefsina. And it's only been published in Greek so far, but she's uh, just working on an English translation now. I went to the sanctuary of Demeter and Corey with her and she gave me amazing, an amazing tour. And um, I learned a lot from her. And one of the things that she's really interested in is this idea of the philosophers or the people from Plato's Academy. Once the Christians smashed up the sanctuary of Demeter and Corey at Elefsina, they took the sacred objects to Plato's Academy and they continued to initiate people there. And because the philosophers had high standing in Athenian society, they inserted some of the ritual, you could argue, theurgic elements of the mysteries of Elefsina into Greek Orthodoxy or into early Christianity. So the, mm. the same kind of theurgic elements are woven into rituals and ceremonies celebrated by the greek orthodox church today if you look at stuff like um well the assumption of the virgin mary which is today uh and this idea of the painless sleep of the virgin and often it seems to be related to dream oracles wherever these churches that are dedicated to the painless sleep of the virgin are built they seem to have some dream oracular essence to them and then one of the first churches ever in greece was built on the sanctuary the site of the sanctuary of the sclepia and it became famous for uh healing miracles in dreams but there's also the the miracle of the snakes emerging on the um assumption of the virgin mary as well and they're obviously associ associated with the Sclepius. But what do you think about this idea that um, the, the initiations were continued and uh, they were acting as hierophants and mystagogues for the mysteries kind of through the philosophical academies? And that does seem to be the role that Iamblichus has. Well, even from the time of Plato, he considered um, his school to be um, a kind of a mystagogia, a, a, a leading into the mysteries. Um, and yet at the same time, they probably also participated in the rites at Eleusis, which were explicitly done with uh, Demeter and Persephone and coming out and dancing, you know, out of the asleep, uh, the, the temple uh, where they had the rituals performed. Um, 
Telesterion, I was thinking that's the word. So um, I don't think that I know of any explicit uh, continuation of the uh, Eleusinian ritual among the Platonists, um, though they were informed by the language and the imagery of the Eleusinian mysteries. I know that Proclus would say and did say that um, the elements of the Eleusinian rites um, are synthemata, that is to say they are, how would you put it, portals to the divine world and that they allow us to take on the shape of the gods if, if we receive them the right way. Some people they put into a state of great fear and trauma, but other people who are ready for them um, enter into the shape of the gods through the use of these Eleusinian um, rituals. So they were very open and sympathetic to it, but I don't know explicitly of the transference of the elements from um, the Eleusis uh, temple to platonic circles. Now your friend Maria, I think you said, maybe she knows something about that that would be very interesting to pursue. Yeah. Um, there's some people who even suggest that um, that the Kikion was a, um, a hallucinogenic um, uh, drink. Uh, yeah. And um, this one fellow has written a book about it. Um, and he, he suggested that that was in fact part of what was going on with the, um, in, in early Christian, the Eucharist was a hallucinogenic drink, he suggests. Yeah. And that he, he says that um, now um, what's going on is that they're just taking it as a placebo <laughs> and, mm. and the, the hallucinogenic properties. And I don't know about that. But I, I, I do believe that the, the Kikion did have hallucinogenic properties. I mean, there's well, a lot of evidence for that. And Maria was telling me that there was a field that was the field of Demeter, and that's where they grew the wheat that this enzyme grew on particularly. And so this was cultivated for the Kikion. Um, I believe it, yeah. Yeah. And the it, fungus. Yeah. And um, uh, she, she describes those rites given the kind of sacrament of the Kikion were yes. about theurgy because you have the sacred objects, you have the kind of performative elements of the revealing of the sacred objects. And yes. that the, she talks about it like the manifestation of uh, divine beings in the Telesterion. That's what- Yes, that's about. exactly what it was, yeah. And, and um, but the people who had drunk from the Kikion, um, whether there are hallucinogenic properties in the Kikion, which I tend to think there are, or if they're not, they'd spent days preparing themselves for this event. So they were in a state of psych uh, psychologically prepared to receive these symbols and to be transformed into, um, to move just from their biological existence into a universal life. Mm. and identify with life itself. So in that way, it was a way of, of overcoming the fear of death because your biological, biological life is going to die. But if you've become fused with universal life through this ritual, there's no more fear of death. Mm. You, and then there's also become... something, uh, I've been to LF Cena when it's springtime and there's something about, uh, obviously we live in a sort of depleted uh a depleted world in terms of nature and biodiversity but the this idea of them being the sacred orgies and this idea of them celebrating the the lesser mysteries celebrating the spring and then the greater mysteries celebrating the abduction of Corey but this idea for me like I'm very much into nature and I think that um uh, ancient people perhaps identified less with self and at these great festivities even more so they became this one collective um, sort of propelling mass of energy and consciousness that could experience these um, transcendence right. quite easily without psychedelics I mean I can't I went to see a play at the theatre of uh, Epidavros the other day the Bacchae and 
even that in its kind of diminished form as a modern theatrical production, when the chorus sing, you get this fantastic bodily sensation of like being lifted up in awe. I can only imagine the level of pomp and circumstance that would have accompanied those rites in ancient times and just how ecstatic an audience could become because there is something uh, transcendent about that collective you know the theater there seats 14,000 people so 14,000 mm. people together experiencing this kind of ecstatic singing or these wild frenzied rites of ecstasy are bound to be affected I agree with you and you know when you think about that um, it really gives me pause uh, with respect to what's going on in the world today and what has happened in our culture when you get groups, large groups of people, all directed and focused in a certain way, doing certain chants, what, whatever they might be, and sometimes we see it in political circles or we'll see it in, in um, social movements, it can be as dangerous as, as it can be transcendent. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I agree. Well, one of the things, you know, talking about Iamblichus having this, like being in this unique position to kind of, have that insight and the understanding of the embodied, possessed, natural um, arts of divination and the more uh, reason-based uh, and the more artificial roles of divination, that, um, mm -hmm. that he would be able to see how the divine essence can have these many faces. And one of the other dreams I had was actually uh, on this night, I think last year or the year before that I was uh, initiated by the Virgin Mary. And I hadn't realized, I, had, I knew about the assumption of the Virgin Mary, but I'd forgotten it was the same day. And it's the day that I know that 30,000 pilgrims go to Tinos and they're all there wanting to have a vision of the Virgin Mary because um, it's her assumption. And they all sleep or don't sleep uh, in this courtyard waiting for her to appear. And in my dream, it felt like I was connecting to something beyond myself because this dream felt somehow like it had nothing to do with me or that I'd I'd engaged in some other kind of collective thought. So, you know, the Virgin does appear to these 30,000 witnesses on Tinos or they collectively create her somehow, almost like a, perhaps like, a, a, uh, what's the word, when you create a um an entity in magic mm, mm. So anyway, the, oh, the, oh right 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 you know almost I mean? like the the jewish idea of the golem which is yeah, what, there's another word for it i can't remember what it is uh, yeah, in, in, yeah in the greek tradition um and the tibetans do it too um mm. create um a kind of a, a divine image but that sounds wonderful your your dream yeah you know, it's interesting how our dreams can coincide and yours have been with significant events outside you. Mm. Um, that's interesting. Well, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a retreat in Greece in May next year with Gary Lackman and uh, Eric Wargo, and it's going to explore dream oracles. So, Did you say Eric Wargo? Yeah. Well, he's he's doing like a virtual presentation for us. But oh, maybe, Greg, okay. you could, maybe, Greg, maybe you could do a virtual presentation for us. Or come well, to Greece. I know Eric Wargo. And he's absolutely wonderful and brilliant. And he, he writes about going backwards in time and things like that. I believe that's Eric Wargo. Yeah, that's um, right. Time loops. Time loops. He's really, really interesting. Um, so when, when is that happening? Uh, that is the 8th to the 15th of May. And we're going to Delphi and the Oracle of Trophonius and then Epidavros. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Gary Lackman's going to go there too. Yeah, Gary. Well, Gary Lackman's coming in person. Eric is just doing something online for us. But he's I really been. Love, yeah, I love. He's been Eric so Lackman. interesting. I love Eric. Gary Lackman. And I had a um, I had a time loopy type dream once when I was at a conference in Tuscany at the Parry Center for Consciousness Studies. And oh, you should definitely go to the Paris Center for Consciousness Study. They'd love you. It'd be a great. Like, it's a brilliant place to go and do talks. Paris Center for Consciousness? Pari, P-A-R-I. It's a little hilltop village in Tuscany. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll look it up. Yeah, it's great. So um, Gary's done talks there as well. But um, 
uh, when I was there, I met a woman who's let, you know, more recently become a very good friend of mine. And she was telling me that she had a daughter called Deborah and um, there wasn't really much else to it. She was telling me about her daughter living in London and having a kid and going to see her. And then that night I had a dream of my best friend at school who was called Deborah. And in my dream, um, she was getting married and she was in her wedding dress. And um, she was saying to me that I had to go to a wedding, but it was on the Isle of Wight. And I was like, oh, I can't afford to go to the Isle of Wight, so I can't come. And it was a silly dream, but I woke up in the morning and I thought, oh, the reason I had this dream about my friend was because uh, her daughter's also called Deborah. So I told Mary the details of the dream and it turned out that her daughter was a filmmaker who made a film about a woman who got married on the Isle of Wight. And the still from the film is a woman in a wedding dress on the Isle of Wight. So that was that was like a time loopy type dream, I thought. Uh, you know, it's, that's exactly right. It's sort of like um, Jungian synchronicity where there is no before and after particularly, yeah. that there's sort of an interweaving. Um, yeah, and it, having experiences like that, dreams like that, um, reflections like that, it's not like you can figure out exactly what they mean, but you know that they're significant. Mm. And, you, and it's sort of, you feel like you're being woven into some sort of um, way of, of experiencing things. Mm. And as long as you stay open to it, then they keep happening. Um, you, at least you're paying attention to it. Well, yeah. that's why I love this idea of the fabric of reality in the cosmos being like one weave, one tapestry, how it really resonates with me that there's divine material that weaves together to create reality, time, space, us, everything. And so that is how I uh, reason that you can dream the future because everything is part of the same fabric and material and time is based on our perception which is localized to this planet and how this planet turns on its axis and beyond that time is eternal and the further you zoom out of the cosmos the more uh obviously cohesive the whole cosmos is i did have a dream once that i was standing on the moon and i saw the earth turn on its axis and i I had the, I know that astronauts, they have this uh, overview effect. And apparently it's something that people can have on psychedelics as well. And it occurred to me after I had this dream that I was standing on the moon and I saw the earth, I never saw the sunrise in the same way. When I saw a sunrise, I recognized and remembered that the sun, the earth is turning and I feel part of the cosmos when I see the sunrise, which is why I like getting up for the sunrise. But I love that because astronauts report that as well, that when they see the sunrise, when they come back to Earth, that they never see it in the same way ever again. Yeah, and they've had profound experiences from, from you know, going their moon journeys. I think Edgar Mitchell is one of the, the people that, that was profoundly moved by um, the uh, journey to the moon. And they, somehow they've kind of become mystics, some of them, yeah. in their own way. Yeah. Well, I so think that is something to do with coming out of earthbound time. And maybe those things can be facilitated by transcendent, theurgic, uh, dream, right, right. psychedelic experiences. So anything that, you know, maybe that's what ecstasy is more about, coming out of time than coming well, out. it certainly is. It's it's coming out of the, the box that we've put ourselves in. Mm. And I think that's what some people try to experience with psychedelics is moving out of the box that, that they've sort of woven themselves into. Mm. Um, the interesting thing that this fellow Michael Pollan says in this book is that um, very, very little children, they don't have the same sort of narrow focus that we adults have things start here and they go there before and after here and there. But, but very little children's minds is, is more broad and spread out. Their consciousness isn't narrow focused. And he said that what happens in psychedelics and they've seen it in brain uh, research is that people go to that same place that yeah. infants go to yeah. or are in. And so <laughs> he said, he had a funny line. He said, it's like um, basically a little babies are tripping all the time. Yeah, I read an article where it was saying it's like babies are on LSD. And I found that quite interesting because I know that in terms of brain development, you have this neuronal pruning back that happens during puberty. And yeah. I think that 
for me, it's part of the reason why I think kids do have such amazing dreams and often lucid dreams as well, is that they spend so much time in their imagination playing and playing mm. and, and like I spent a lot of time in imaginative play as a child and I, you know, I had lucid dreams since I was little and um, and I do think preserving something of that childish wonder of life and not ascribing too much certainty to the material right. forms helps with accessing lucid lucidity. Playing with it rather than explaining it. Yeah, exactly. Like I remember, I remember I went to this uh, lecture once at uh, Swedenborg House in London. You know Swedenborg mm -hmm. House, and I just kind of stumbled across it. I'd been in the British Museum, and uh, there happened to be a talk on South American magical realism happening upstairs. And I was like, I like South American magical realism. I'll go to that. So I went to the lecture, and then the guy giving the lecture was William Rowlandson, who I'd seen talk at a psychedelic conference breaking convention at Greenwich University a couple of years ago about fairies, elves, and gnomes. And so after the talk, um, I went up to him and I was like, oh, I saw you um, uh, talk about fairies, elves, and gnomes at breaking convention. And he was like, oh, I know you, you talk about lucid dreaming. And I was like, yeah. And he said, well, I don't know if I'm uh, not in a dream now. He, and I was wearing this jacket and I had lots of little badges and brooches on it. And he went, I don't know if all those little brooches and badges don't represent weird things that have happened in my life over you know, the last 40 years or whatever. And I was like, well, actually, all of these weird brooches and bar badges do reflect something weird that's happened in my life over the last 40 years. And then at that very moment, I had this absolutely like embodied sense of I can't tell whether this is a dream or not. This like I, my body felt amazing. And then in that second, a woman in the front row turned round and she was wearing a cap that said, is this a dream? And like I got goosebumps, like it was amazing. And then on the train home, I was trying to recapture that sense of almost infancy where you don't know what the name of anything is and you don't know what, like the forms of anything, you don't know what they are. And everything started to kind of coalesce and I started to see... Uh, the seat covers on the train as being Tutankhamun's death mask and a train in the distance being like a metal serpent. And it was, I couldn't hold on to it for too long because it was so overwhelming. And then years and years later, like 15 years later, um, I started this dream palace project in Athens and we were, I run a 10 day residency in Athens with artists trying to connect more with dreams to bring more sort of creative inspiration through dreams and the woman that I partnered with who I just happened to um, make friends with uh, through mutual friends I realized after we'd been working for about six months together that she had been the woman in the front row of that audience who had the cap on that said is this a dream <laughs> so it's like oh my this gosh. amazing like full circle experience it was great that moment, though, when you described it, that with the buttons and talking to this fellow and, and what he said sort of triggered you and opened you, and then her turning around with the cap, it's almost like you, you had the, the fabric of the world sort of torn right open in front of you, yeah. and you dropped into a different yeah. awareness. Well, that's what, and that's what lucidity feels like. It almost feels like the kind of toroidal point of observation and, and one of the things I notice in dreams because uh in lucidity you seem to see from multiple perspectives simultaneously so it's not like time expands in a linear fashion time seems to become multi-dimensional and expansive and um, I've got a friend, Daniel Aldis, in the States who does a lot of uh, sleep lab experiments. And he's done a lot of experiments to um, uh, look into time perception in dreamers. And lucid lucidity, apparently, lucid dreams, they occur fair, at like a fairly similar time to reality. Like if you were to count in a lucid dream, it would fairly match time in reality. But it feels like it's expansive or greater because you have these various points of perception. And so to me, that's, you know, when I was a little kid, I always thought that lucid dreaming seemed to me to be, um, if you mastered it as an art, it seemed to be a way to transcend death because you seem to be able to um, exist, to, to experience eternity in a moment. That That's what it feels like to me. And I guess that's the whole idea of uh 
the Neoplatonist in a way is that you discover the ocean in the drop. It's very similar to that concept. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, lovely. Um, I, I really, um, I'm delighted to hear you share your experience. It sounds like you've really been living a rich life there with, by staying, by honoring the lucidity that you've experienced in the dreams and knowing that there's something incredibly valuable about that. And you, you keep, you're staying with it and, and it's leading you into these different interesting paths and um, meeting people and organizing conferences and, um, and you're trusting it. Yeah, I think that it's been the defining feature of my life. It's been like the best thing of my life. So I'm happy to, that's why I'm happy to be homeless in England and follow my dream in Greece because it's the most important thing. It's, well, it's thank you for inviting to, to talk to you. <laughs> huh? It's what? It feels like the path to immortality. Well, you're already on it. Yeah, I guess we're all on it, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I think we are. Yes. Um, and it's kind of a, a paradox, but we are, yeah. And I, uh, one of my kind of paradoxical sort of thoughts about the amblicus and, and theurgy is that it's only by recognizing our mortality that we get a real sense of our immortality, mm. that, that it's revealed to us by, through the window of our mortality. Um, but, so much, you know, we can poetically reflect on these things. It's really, um, I really appreciate you reaching out though to I talk really to me about theurgy. And thoroughly and enjoyed that. that so much. I would love to do it again sometime. And if you ever want to come to Greece and do an event mm -hmm. in Greece, please, I would think that would that would just be incredible. Have you, do you go to Greece much? Well, um, I'm going to be going for the first time this November. Um, I'm going for a conference. We're going to talk about the Oracle at Delphi and other oracles. Um, and I'll be in Athens um, right. for that. Yeah. I'll be there in November. November. I'll come and see in you. In November? Yeah. In November. Yeah. All right. Well, stay in touch. I mean, we've got each other's emails, and I can tell you when I'll be there and where I'll be. And awesome. let's, let's meet. We could meet. Right. Yeah, that would be awesome. Whereabouts in Athens is this thing? I don't know. It's a Swedish group. Okay. Uh, that, um, and uh, but I, I'll, I'll give you the name of it, and they even have a, an address and so on. So right, that I don't know Athens. Oh, okay. uh, Athens is wonderful. We can go to the uh, Hill of the Muses. Wonderful, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's got a lot of places that are worth seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An atmosphere there. Yeah. Well, so it's a delight to meet you, and thank you, and we'll stay in touch. Yeah, great. All right, All right. thank you.